we need folks that need to call this meeting of the City of Honolulu Development Review Board to order. My name is Phil Zalinger. I serve as chair. The other members to my right are Jack Lindley, Kevin O'Connell, <clears throat> Mike Miller, staff, Roger Kranz, Daniel Richardson, Pete McCarthy. So the first item on the agenda is to um, identify who the five voting members who are going to be on participating in tonight's decision. I'm happy to abstain. Just facilitate the hearing. So the five members will be Jack, Kevin, Roger, Daniel, and Kate. Speaking of five members participating in the decision, is the date when the Charter amendment will be effective. I don't know if have you heard if it's passed. I know last week I saw um, John Odom going over to meet with GovOps, and they were going to fast track it. I, as far as I know, it hasn't been passed yet. Okay, the legislature has to approve of the proposed charter changes. I think that's. So they usually combine it all in one bill. Yeah. So it's everybody. Yeah, all of them. But uh, my understanding was that GovOps took it up last week, so and they were fast tracking it. So and usually it's one of the last bills out. I right, so we're still in the purgatory. Yeah. All right. So to be the news at eleven, film at eleven. Uh, next item will be approval of the agenda. I move that we accept the agenda as printed. Motion, motion by Dan, second by Roger. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hands. Agenda. I wasn't. Oh, agenda, sorry. You're here now. Okay. <laughs> here with the program. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Comments from the chair. There are, there are, the chair does have this comment for the public. I'm going to recuse myself from participating in the second matter on tonight's agenda, the application on Elm Street, having had a relationship with the applicant in the past. So, next item is approval of the minutes on April 2nd, 2018. I was Jack, Roger, be accepted as printed. Second. Motion by Jack, second by Kate. All those with the capacity to vote, please so signify your approval by raising your right hand. Minutes are adopted. Moved and second. Which brings us to the first item 170 Spring Hollow Lane, application of Amanda Kitchen. Good evening, I'm Don Marsh, Grinder Engineering, engineer on the project. I'm Richard Rubin, I'm Amanda's stepfather, but I'm also here as her lawyer. Is that an editorial comment? Yeah. Well, it's okay. a difficult role, I must admit. <laughs> Which <laughs> one? Both. <laughs> Two hats. But. And she's out of town, so I'm doing it for her. Don, would you please raise your right hand? It's always for the evidence you're about to give on the matter under consideration. Yes. Thank you. Uh, why don't you give us a brief outline of the application and then we'll discuss the new ordinance. Okay. Uh, this is a existing, uh, existing four acre parcel at the end of Spring Hollow Lane near the uh, cul de sac. Parcel is frontage on uh, Spring Hollow Lane itself and frontage on the uh, cul de sac. And then it has about half of the acreage is in the rear, uh, behind a, a second lot on uh, uh, 
in all that. And yeah, the purpose of this is to, to create two two acre lots in the uh, residential 24,000 district, so we're well in excess of the required uh, acreage. This land in the rear, just as a point of background, at one point were two separate lots as part of a lot of a 1973 subdivision. We didn't include that in the application because it's just more general information. But the two lots were down here. There's a whole subdivision that was east of Spring Hollow Lane. Most of these houses have purchased rear lots that were part of that former uh, flat. So it's a uh, there were two parcels back there, each about an acre. We originally looked at trying to represent that they were still separate lots, but the language in the deeds about 15 or 20 years ago sold them together with the front lot. It wasn't clear that they didn't say specifically that they were merged, but they were sold all in, you know, both mentioned in the same lot and uh, the same deed. And they subsequently been transferred as all in the same with lots that came earlier. So we felt that it would be cleaner both now for you and in the long term for clear title to um, create this as a, as a two lot subdivision. So it's uh, approximately two acres. And it's, it is a, it, it meets the section Three three zero zero two F three B, which is when you're creating a new lot. Um, if it's an irregular lot, you need to have twenty feet of frontage, not a right away, but frontage. So this lot is comprised with a long twenty foot wide finger to the. Uh, portion of the existing lot so that it, in fact, has the required frontage on, uh, on Spring Hollow Lane. Let me turn it over. Um, and it, it shows a little bit bigger. Um, so this is a man who's existing lot on Spring Hollow Lane here, cul-de-sac. So we have this 20-foot portion of the lot itself that feeds back to a, a larger portion. And on this, to, in the new ordinance, uh, slopes are more of a concern. So we've done a slope analysis, and those areas that are in the light gray are um, less than 15% slope, so easily buildable. And then as you get to the dark blue, those are slopes that would be prohibited uh, from development. There's a small section about 480 square feet up in the front of the road, which actually was caused, it's man-made, it was caused with the construction of the cul-de-sac where there was a cut and fill in a road ditch. So that area is actually uh, over 30%. And except for the provision in the ordinance of 3007D4, which allows us to exclude small, isolated areas of slopes uh, greater than 30% in your slope calculation. And now we sort of we meet that literally. I would argue that my thought is the intent of the ordinance was that you don't build on 30% slopes, not that you couldn't construct the driveway through an existing road ditch where the road had artificially lowered and steepened the contours in order to, to build the cul-de-sac. So um, that's for consideration. We have shown building envelopes that show uh, significant land within the proposed lot for construction of a, of a home. And also significant land that would uh, with some clearing allow for uh, solar uh, solar access as required by the by the new ordinance. 
that's almost Any questions? Any square feet are uh, at the end of that driveway in that impaired area? About 480. So it's under the 500. It's under the 500. He did the measurements? Oh, yeah. I have a question that relates yes. to getting to know our new ordinance, and I thank you for bearing bearing with us. Um, do we have a definite? I didn't see a definition of building envelope in the back. Is there one? Uh, there, it is addressed. Um, there isn't a building envelope provision. It is in section. Uh, it's in section three, and what it j basically says, and I can hunt down the exact thing for you, is that you can put them on, oh, 3503.C, which says building and building envelopes on recorded flats shall be representative only and be placed to demonstrate a suitable area for development. Approval of a plat with a house site or building envelope shall not be inferred as a permit to build such a structure, nor shall it be a limitation on future development outside of the envelope or house site unless included as a condition of approval. Of approval. Uh, the reason for that is we had a number of old plats that had been, every time somebody put in a plat, they would put in the setbacks and say this is the building envelope, and then we would change the setback requirements and zoning, and then in order to build the deck or build the porch, they have to go and file an amended plat, which was a three-step process before they could get a permit to build the deck into the area. So we just eliminated the building envelope. Unless you require it as a condition, it's just meant to demonstrate this is an area that's buildable. Okay, so for example, we could require it as a condition, not in this case, but if there were an area that were unsuitable for development on the parcel, that would be excluded from the building envelope to protect that area. Yes. Okay, so it does have that function. Thank you. Unless development was already prohibited in those other Unless areas. it was otherwise prohibited. Okay, so. mm -hmm. uh, and I, I will point out there were a couple of pieces because I was uh, playing a little bit of catch up at the end of last week. Um, you'll see a number of points. This is sketch plan review of this application. So there are a number of little points that I had highlighted and read in my staff report, most of which I didn't have large concerns about. I think they were just pieces that of information I had to get from Don. Um, and I highlighted pieces that I thought were things that needed to be addressed. But some of these other ones, like existing lot coverage, it's going to be clear that it meets it. Mm -hmm. I just don't have the number to go and say it meets it. But um, So there are a couple of pieces you'll see in there that may be highlighted in red. And it's only red because I didn't have an opportunity to, to have a conversation with Don to get those numbers. Do we no longer have the ability Sketch plan and final approval in the same scene here? I don't think we can. You mean preliminary and final? I'm, I'm sorry. Preliminary and final? Preliminary is now gone. Preliminary is now gone. Yes. So you'll you always have sketch and you'll always jump to final. Now you could in final end up needing two hearings to get through final. Um, but if somebody comes in fully prepared and you can approve it in one hearing and final, then that's up to up to you guys in the quality of the application. On the issue of frontage, um, when you propose a twenty foot frontage, that's that's requesting the DRB to reduce the seventy five foot frontage down to twenty. Is that right, Tom? Well. I'd like to phrase it in a more positive term. <laughs> um, I'm at, we're really asking, we do need DRB approval, but just that the DRB approves it um, in accordance with a reduces the frontage requirement to not less than 20 feet for irregularly shaped lots or lots that by share driveway. That's not the case. So it's on page 3-6. Uh, technically, it is reducing it, yes, from the 70. And again, I mean, part of this is just because we're going through. This is like 
the second or third application under the new zoning bylaws. And <clears throat> this is an irregularly shaped plot in part because of the choice that you're making with the design, but also um, because of the cul-de-sac, the, the circular drive. It's not as if it's a long rectangular uh, a straight line of frontage. It's on the circle. Well, and also it's because that Amanda had purchased essentially four lots earlier. So I, I'm, I think this is a regular shaped lot, even though it's on the cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she has two more acres in the back is sort of where we were thinking it fit into that irregular shaped um, definition. Based on the history you gave that's also provided in the materials, I think it's also an irregularly shaped lot today because in the past it was meant to be served by a road parallel, the one that goes to the cul-de-sac. So it's irregular because of the way it's accessed now. It wouldn't have been irregular if that road had been built. So it's irregularity is a function of history and how we want to use it today. Correct. Yes. It would have been at the end of that other, well, it would have been bordered on that other loop road. So it wasn't created as an irregular lot because as envisioned it would have been quite normal. <laughs> yes. Well, I see that you addressed all of the sections that relate to the subdivision standards. This is sketch plan review. I don't think we have to go through all of them. Just make sure that we look at all of them in front. But uh, just go through them and use any ordinance. Let me ask you this question. Do you want the board to reduce the frontage to 20 feet? Yes. That's going to create a finger that's 20 feet wide. 235 feet long? Uh, yes. Sorry. Yep. Yes. Oh. And you'll install a driveway? Within that, yes. There's actually sort of an old wood road that, that uh, a grown up wood road that's sort of in that same alignment, as it turns out. Is that where utilities will be run through, electric and such? Electric and water. Wastewater would be on site. Right. So there's no city sewer up there. But electric cable, phone lines, the essentials. Yes. Um, and that the width is sufficient for both um, a driveway that will meet the uh, uh, emergency services minimum as well as the utilities. Yes, I'd be for 20 feet, so it'd be probably a 15 foot driveway. And then you know, we need a curb cut, of course, from from DBW, which we anticipated to get in, uh, in advance of, of ultimately a zoning permit. So, so there's a driveway that's 15 feet in width. You'll leave, the, leave you with all 30 inches on either side of the driveway. Yes. I mean, we. What kind of impact will that have on the other the, the neighbors' parcel? Yeah, it won't have any impact on the. I haven't done a site visit, so I'm not sure where the house is constructed on the neighbors' parcel. Um, the one to the south here is right. It's, 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 um, it's right in here. Uh, which finger? You have all four fingers on that. Yeah, right there. <laughs> it's, in that hole. It's, 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 it's right there. Right, it's right there. Okay. Actually, they have a stone wall that sort of runs along the property line, right. so we'll be up above behind the stone wall. What, what is the width needed by the fire trucks to get to that structure? Have you consulted the uh, We have fire not. Department? I mean, it, it typically 15 foot driveway is what. We've gone shorter, but typically we do a 15-foot driveway. Mm -hmm. 
access is less. And as long as we have a turning radius to get in, which you have to have a you know, turning radius to, to get into it. Mm -hmm. I'm not too concerned about the driveway width. 15 seems appropriate. Maybe less is more when it comes to plowing and and traveling and such. But um, the, we do have a note here that there may be a requirement that it be built to the B71 standard. And does that standard include width requirements, or does it have more to do with um, the base and such? Width, but also a, a radius on either side for 30 foot radius is what we're looking at. I mean, really. So it's, Realistically, like it's not about the width. It doesn't require you to go wider than 15. No, I'd have to. I wouldn't want you to get stuck with a 20 foot uh, wide piece of land and a 24 foot right. requirement. <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet, to be honest. I mean, if that were the case, what would be easily done is that, it, and we <clears> may <throat> end up, Amanda may have to give this lot an easement for drainage and filling because I, by the time we get done, DPW had some questions about drainage. We may have to put a road ditch on the upper side, so it it, it may not realistically fit on, on that. Like I said, we uh, were trying narrower to is it, better it, for... And before we come to final, we can have a discussion with them and maybe it would be more appropriate that it's a 30-foot finger. We were just trying to meet sort of the minimum requirement. Perfect. And I don't mean to encourage you to go wider. I'm just sort of curious how all these things fit together. Thanks. How much you do with that 30 inches? Easement. Easement. Well, it, it doesn't say easement here. It says 235 foot finger. I mean, I was thinking even from like a plowing perspective, it's going to be just sloping off a lot. Then that 30 foot, the 30 inch. I don't think there'll be a problem. There's a lot of space between Amanda's house and the driveway. Yeah. So, so to create an additional easement for putting a conduit in or whatever, I right. think that's going to be an issue. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's an easily solved problem with it with an easement. It's just concern that once Amanda sells this lot, second lot, she sells her own. I could see a future set of landowners that might get into a fight about that if there was a clear form of an easement. That's why you have to own all the green ones to build hotels. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not particularly enamored of this part of the new ordinance that allows us to, to shrink the frontage down to 20 feet right. and allow a 250 foot driveway but what it says on the paper in front of me, so I guess I'll flex this. The old ordinance basically permitted a subdivision and then you just give an easement of 20, 20 feet so that you wouldn't create a finger, but you could accomplish the same you know, infill. I think the easement was 25 feet. Or might have been 15. It seems like with Leapfrog Hollow, we had a 50 foot line. But the, you know, the intention was to come, I think, was to you know, commit the, the back, the lot to backfill. And now, because of the new ordinance, we actually have to deed what normally would have been done with a right of way, which makes it kind of look funny, but it essentially creates the same result. Neither of which are optimal, but we understand that that's one of the consequences of what is called now infill. Just the word I was going to use. I mean, it's, it's a two-acre lot in, you know, literally downtown. It's, it's right. a logical place to put dwelling units next to at least part, you know, municipal services, close to municipal services, not all of them. Right. Uh, I'm primarily concerned with the idea that, um, you know, this lot could ultimately be subdivided again, mm -hmm. given the density, right. and that when they do, they won't have another bite at, at the access, this, this finger. And so whether it's, whether it's deeded as the new zoning bylaws seem to require, um, or 
in easement. I just I think it's important to make sure that the that 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 road to Berlin, as it were, um, is sufficient for future uses, and that you don't cut off you know the the value of this property to be either subdivided again or you know create additional infill when when the time's appropriate. It may be difficult to further. I don't think there's any. We have no intention of doing that. But it's, it, because of the slopes down below, it may be difficult to put a further subdivide this lot once a house is built, kind of at the end of that finger, on the gray light gray areas of the house site. There's plenty of room around there. Plenty of room for setbacks. To attempt to put another house in there would be really very difficult. It would be especially difficult without um, wastewater, right? I mean, you couldn't get three septics back there. It would probably be the main limitation. True. Or two, if you ended up with I, two. We haven't done the exploratory uh, soil testing yet, but I agree. By the time you put a septic system in, it, it, it gobbles up a fair amount of land. And, and we need, both from not being able to develop, I mean, in the blue areas, for instance, we can't develop by your ordinance. Technically, we can't cut any trees. Which is a little conflict with having to have the the uh, solar access for eighty percent of your your uh, first floor, but and by the time you put the contours in for a septic system, there isn't there's not a lot of land. But Westview Avenue is obviously still on the land record somewhere. Well, that was the escape out of that neighborhood. So if you had that Westwood Avenue created at some point, you would then have access to the, mm -hmm. the buildable part that's left there. And then we wouldn't have a 20 foot tall to hold the foot down. Unfortunately, all of that road is now owned by a separate landowner. Well, but isn't there, wasn't there a deed left somewhere for that? I don't believe so. I was been involved in other land discussions in that area, and to my knowledge, there's no that that doesn't exist anymore. It's in most of it's in one person's ownership. You read the. Uh Public Works comments. Yes. And I went up and looked at the drainage. It's pretty hard to tell. There are some culverts there, and it looks like we can have a road ditch that would bring it into a culvert in front of Amanda's house. But it, it is unclear how water crosses from the outside to the inside of the cul de sac. So I'll follow up with DPW on that prior to our filing. So, so this key subdivision. Plan is we've not engineered it. We just <coughs> generally design the perimeter and we'll engineer it later. Well, our thoughts were, and I assume it's appropriate in the ordinance, is that we had obtained the subdivision um, and then um, prior to asking for a zoning permit. Then we would get the, the curb cut, the water and sewer uh, addressed, mm -hmm. and um, the driveway designed uh, as part of the, uh, the zoning permit. But my understanding was this was strictly the subdivision. And I think we have enough data to demonstrate that it's, it's uh, possible to subdivide the parcel and build upon it within the ordinance. Subtly different from what we've been dealing with twenty-five years mm -hmm. the board itself. Are there any other questions from the OD members? <clears throat> like, you know, is our sketch plan jurisdiction similar to what it was in the On the last page, the back page does mm -hmm. outline what the sketch plan, DRB shall make recommendations to guide the applicant in preparation of 
more detailed plans. You can request additional application materials deemed necessary to determine compliance with these regulations or and or request that the advisory committee review and make recommendations on the application as appropriate. We probably don't have any advisory committee reviews we need on this project. It's on the back page of the One had the wrong picture on it. <laughs> Throwing everybody off with the wrong All picture. Projects look like Elm Street. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street. What's the pleasure of the DRB? Actually, Mr. Chair, why may I ask? Um, Mike indicated pointed out that we had not addressed the location of an extra shed on the existing Amanda Kitchen parcel, and we didn't show setbacks on that parcel itself. And so we'll, we'll do that prior to final. Um, he did suggest also that the lot one be surveyed. We've obviously served, surveyed the lot two. We would, we would like to ask a waiver from that if we can. We'd prefer to just stay with that one surveyed parcel if we could. But I suspect that's up to the board's discretion. Exactly. It's it's two acres, so it's well beyond. And the other things we need to show, we'll, we'll give you the calculation of the coverage on the existing lot to demonstrate that it meets the percentage coverage. And it's way in excess of that because it's two acres. But um, I think those details we need to provide, but we would Asked that the requirement for a survey of the existing uh, retained lot be waived if possible. It's the pleasure of the board. I have one more question. Um, is it conceivable that in the future the neighboring landowners along Spring Hill? Each, many of whom have bought the lots in the back may want to do the same thing. And I'm asking this for, for the board's contemplation in, as we think of suitability of land for development and character of the area. Um, it, we're doing this once, it seems suitable. We've got a lot of good information about it. Um, how, how might we think about this if each landowner along there wanted to do that with their backyard? Do we need to think about that future possibility when we're thinking of suitability and when we're thinking of the neighborhood as a whole? I guess my own thinking on that is that we, we could speculate, but we don't know. You know, I know that the, the, the way that I walk down in that neighborhood, I'm not sure those other back parts off of Spring Hollow are necessarily will meet, as this does, an area to, that is buildable. So they're more sloped. They are more sloped. Okay. All right, so I'm not as familiar with that area, do I you think, are? I think that has to be a lot by lot. Okay. Just considering they were subdivided in the past, I didn't know if someday that would be appealing again and how we might think of the neighborhood as a whole. But with, we, with the tools we have to work with right now, mm -hmm. the ordinance guides us, the new ordinance guides us. And I don't think we have the tools within that to, to speculate about what could possibly happen in the future. I'm just thinking precedent, character of the area, so. Um, you're right. I don't think we hang anything on that. I'm just sort of thinking if we end up with little fingers of land um, and ev from every backyard, I think we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Well, I think you have to take, I think we have to take the application that's in front of us and mm -hmm. uh, judge that against the ordinance. Thank you for entertaining my inquiry about the character Steve, of the area. Where, where did you pick up character of the area? It's uh, section three five or seven. Character of the neighborhood and settlement pattern. You know, settlement pattern by definition isn't about a single site, it's about the collection of sites and how they're built upon.
tell lawyers wrote this. By a lawyer. It was not. It wasn't. <laughs> I think I have the answer that I, as much satisfaction as I need for tonight in thinking about this, we don't need to spend any more time on it, but I think it's worth, as we get get to know this ordinance, thinking about how these puzzle pieces fit together. Like that's what the town is, is puzzle pieces. That's how we do it. This is how we do it. Maybe it's individual application of the whole If you're going to add the shed that's on the kitchen lot on lot one. Yes. Can you also depict in general terms the improvements on the uh, other adjacent lot so we get a sense for where the buildings are and where the driveways are as well yes it's a pleasure to the board about waiving their bearing on a survey of lot one Mike's recommendation to the applicant that it be surveyed. Imagine what would happen under this proposal is that kitchen deed would read <coughs> a lot of meets and bounds description of lot two, and with the result being that that which was not conveyed is retained. And so lot one would not have a meets and bounds description. As it doesn't have one now, like more likely than not. So, I, I can explain why we're asking for this. If you go down Spring Hollow Lane, all those lots in the old development was in development. Paul Hannon tried to kind of determine where those boundaries are, and they're really difficult. They're they're not precise in the subdivision, the original subdivision. You know, they kind of land on the ground has to find where those lots are that they're good sized lots and it would be very difficult to have a precise survey of the retained two acre lot on which Amanda's house now sits um, and, and I don't believe that there's a survey there's a survey of the Aviati lot which is the one you just asked to have the house located on there's that survey but other than that I don't believe those lots have been surveyed it's quite difficult there's no boundaries on the perimeter to reference. We have a line on the backside on the, on the existing lot, which is itself by some use and will be filed. And then the lot two that's being sold or subdivided. So that's why we asked for the waiver. It would be very expensive to, to have Paul create a new survey of that. I'm okay with waiving that uh, requirement. Where's the requirement for the survey coming from, just so we have the, the language? I think it was a recommendation from staff. Did you, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't premised on a particular requirement. In the no. Well, typically, typically when <clears throat> I, at least in my history of. Uh, doing this for other communities that when, when you do a two lot subdivision both lots are new and both lots are surveyed um, and then usually there'd be an exception for carving out a two acre piece on a hundred acre farm you're not going to ask them to survey the hundred acre farm to cut off two acre piece but usually the smaller ones a sub this is a two lot subdivision typically both lots would be subdivided but, or surveyed but it's a, a determination you guys can make I guess I would be looking for the harm that would be created by not doing this work. It's not seeming as though we've done this all already to establish that. I'm not seeing where the harm is. There is a difficulty in that whole area. <clears throat> if anybody remembers who put that table put together, you'll know why. I think maybe to meet people today who paid for the sins of the past. And I don't see any problem of waiving that requirement. And I would not go near to have those conversations. Does it complicate the city's management of land records if there is not 
survey filed? No, it would be more critical, I think, if boundary lines were closer. I mean, this is a residential 24,000. It's a two-acre zoning. It's, you know, we're probably not looking at anything where the setbacks are critical or the frontage is critical. Or usually that would be a much more critical situation if we thought perhaps this line is plus or minus 10 or 20 feet um, and it's going to make a big difference. I think um, hearing now that the Abiati lot is surveyed, at least you've got a, a reasonable expectation that 20 feet off of that pin is going to probably be accurate. If that had been an unsurveyed lot, that may be a 20 foot finger that's now being placed on somebody else's property because we aren't sure where that boundary is. But obviously, Abiati knows their boundary, so the 20 feet would probably be reasonable on that side. It's not, it's not a congestion. Those lots have been sold for 50 years with reference to an original survey on Spring Hollow Lane. So she's got lot X and lot Y from the original survey. That's how it was always from the beginning referenced. So that, those, that references how they were sold. I have no, I have no problem going down there. It stops her in Johnston. Is that Jimmy Johnston? Yes. Can you stop? But Jimmy John is that was that Jimmy Johnston who was in who was in well it says stop in Johnston so I know it's stop but is it Jimmy Johnston yes please don't go uh, so in the past we always reviewed we always approached sketch plan review as providing the applicant with a weather report view of what the project was, so is there anything else that TRP members would like to add? It's pretty straightforward. I don't know if there are any members of the public that had any comments on this. The application materials were really easy to read. Thank you. Make sure that all the comments are in there. There is easy to read. That's what I said. That's what I said. We're matting matters. Yeah, very well. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. you. Uh, I advised those in attendance at the outset of the meeting that I was going to, it was necessary for me to recuse myself from the next item. So, Vice Chair Dan, let's continue now. Sure. Item of business is the uh, Elm Street application between 
Good evening. So if you uh, state your name for the record um, and with Basti and what you're appearing before the board. Sure. My name is Josh Jackson. I'm a partner in Timber Homes Revolve. I'm Shannon McIntyre, also a partner in Timber Homes. So uh, this is the major safe plan review and conditional use of the one community home for Chuck Road. So if you raise your right hand, you saw them swear or affirm that you oh Don, are you appearing on this as well? Okay. I just put you under oath as well. Um, you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence and testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pain and penalties of perjury. Yeah. So, uh, why don't we start out just because uh, it's helpful for us to get an overview. Yeah. Mike, if you're ready to give a, sort of kind of an overview of the project, or do you want me to start with the applicant? Um, trying to decide what's going to be the easiest. It's a little, it's a complicated um, application, so it is major site plan, it is conditional use. It is uh, currently a vacant lot on Elm Street. Uh, it is uh, was previously approved last year with uh, three residential units. It has it was not subdivided. It continues to be a 9.1 acre lot. And so the proposal that they'll be coming in is going to require the conditional use approval for two elements. Of it, which includes the light industry, or actually it's a light manufacturing, and outdoor storage for the timber piles. And so that's the, the two major things. And then the major site plan is because there is a construction of a principal building, then they're now required to go through the major site plan. So that kind of lays out a little bit of the groundwork. It is in the rural zoning district and it is in the Wrightsville neighborhood. So it is out past the nature center. Okay. Uh, if you want to take us in a little bit deeper to this project, introduce us to it, um, and then we'll start to go through. Board will no doubt have questions as we go through, um, and then we'll start to march through some of these criteria. Sure. Good. Oh, excuse me, sir. Just, just to be clear, the applicants will have their opportunity to present, and then um, if you have any comments, feedback, questions, we'll give you an opportunity, and there's a microphone for that to stay on. Okay, sure. So, um, as Mike described, this is a currently vacant lot. Uh, this is the Vermont Tree Experts property right here. That's Pearl Street Motors right there. So it's an open uh, meadow with a knoll in the middle of it. North Branch of the Winning Scheme running at the rear of the property. And uh, we last fall got permission to put three residences back here behind the knoll. Uh, and what we're asking for uh, zoning permission for this evening or sketch plan review on the uh, fourth grade, whether it do those all in one or not, is uh, the creation of a timber framing shop with an office. Proposed to have a horseshoe driveway here, a staging and loading area, these uh, timber piles, and uh, a woodshed. There's office and visitor parking here. There's uh, an additional five spaces around the workshop parking there. Mr. Chair, we've, we've already approved part of this already. Right. So we don't need to kick that can. The three residential in the back, that's not up. That's not my understanding. We're just simply looking for the two conditional uses, which we'll probably dive into first, and then the sort of major site plan review because you're seeking to, and really focused on the, the front part of the lot with that, um, the industry related and manufacturing. 
So when you say you're putting uh, storing covered timber, could you describe what that will look like, what that's going to entail? Yeah. So uh, the nature of our work is that we uh, fabricate timber frame structures, barns, homes, outbuildings, and that involves lots of these timbers. And, uh, and so we build piles like that. And as you can see, we build a fair number of them uh, in order that they to place them behind the woodworking facility. They are, they need to be, and we keep them uh, tidy. If they're not tidy, the timbers twist and uh, we keep them covered with uh, temporary roots to prevent them from getting stained or uh, excessively sun damaged. Uh, and uh, we would propose to screen those. Uh, you all were happy with that photograph. I have that. We propose to screen those with. Uh, we are required uh, by virtue of having about 300 feet of perimeter to put in, I think it's 10 uh, root trees or uh, 10 trees. So we propose to use fruit trees to meet that requirement. And uh, there's a shrub requirement in the, in the ordinance of a shrub for every five feet of uh, building perimeter. And we propose to use uh, a willow fedge here, which is a, uh, it's a fence that's made, made out of woven willow. So that building fence would like to grow a fence right there. But we also have some plantings down here. So we're proposing to screen them both by, by placing them behind the structure and then by planting um, in front of them to reduce their visual impact, although they themselves look uh, a great deal like a fence. So, so the, the wood piles, these are, you could maybe just describe how tall are they and how long? It's hard to tell from the picture. Well, they, they vary. Typically, we're building the piles four feet wide. And they vary anywhere from a short pile would be eight feet long, and a long pile might be 30 feet long. We occasionally work timbers that long. A typical pile is in the 16 to 20 foot length. And uh, generally, those piles, they're usually five to six feet tall. Very occasionally, they're taller than that, but not much. It becomes difficult and dangerous to manage them, and often they're shorter than that. In and is the whole pile then moved to a job site? Is that what they're assembled for? Right, exactly. So in the, when we receive timbers, we put them into a pile, and we immediately are spacing them out. And what we want to have air movement around every timber. So we're spacing them out horizontally and vertically with stickers. Uh, and then as we, after we work them, they go into a done pile. And it is the case that we could have four or five frames that we cut over the course of a winter, and none of them are going to go up until the summertime. So thus we end up with a fair amount of timber around us. Uh, and then one, we like to pile them in such a way that we can, we work with glass and crane out of St. Johnsbury, and they'll drive in with their crane truck and trailer, and they'll literally pick up entire piles and put it on either their tr crane truck or their trailer. So we tend to make that pile very tidy and, and uh, exactly four feet wide, so you can put two piles on the back of the other truck. And so that earlier step where you talk about getting the timber yeah. originally, is that stored outside or inside? Same thing. We, you know, we don't have room to store a whole, it would, suddenly you wouldn't have anywhere to work. So a frame arrives, generally in stages, and we put those piles around the, the work area, and then as we're prepared to work, then we bring them in, and then they go back out when they're when all the joinery has been cut, in the case of a house, they've been planted in a row. So, so it's actually sort of two types of, of wood piles, just so I understand. It's the, You'd have a hard time wrong. telling the difference between them. They don't look any, I mean, we have to be just as tidy with them okay. in the beginning because if the piles are uh, twisted, the timbers are, are affected by that. So we have to keep those piles level and we space them out in essentially the same way when we receive them as when we store them prior to shipment or raising. And so when do the when do the timber piles come in? Is it seasonal or throughout the year? Oh no, it's happening all the time. So okay. 
uh, we've described in our in our uh, materials that we probably get a timber on average a timber delivery maybe once or twice a week, and on average we might deliver a finished frame. It, it tends to happen more in the warmer months, but uh, I would imagine we're delivering. If we have a, a frame going up once or twice a month. And just so I understand, these it looks like uh, about like 20 stacks that you're proposing uh, around? 24 stacks. 24. Okay. Um, is that the maximum or is that the average or? Well, there might be times when there aren't any of those there. There might right. be times when we have more than we would like and there's we have to use up some of our loading area to store some timbers. In part, I'm just trying to flesh out because part of what we have to do with conditional use, just to understand where I'm going with these questions, is um, you know we have to understand the, the nature of the use. And one of the things that we're talking about is storing this wood. That we have to make these findings. Does it have an impact on the neighborhood? Does it have an impact on the air? And so part of that is just figuring out what this looks like and, and flushing it out. And so certainly more information is better. And and I'm just trying to understand as well. You know, you represent these very neat piles but is it you know is, is are you seeking so you're saying that if there's if there's more than 24 like this time of year would presumably your piles would be bigger because you've spent all winter preparing them but you haven't had an opportunity to send them out to the building sites yeah yet yeah <laughs> um, especially in this weather yeah um, so you might have more than 24 and you would put it in the loading area at that point um, but and then that would be your overflow, which which would then decrease as the as the year goes by because of course all these frames would go out to job sites. Yeah, we would tend to have a lot less timber in the middle of the summer than we would right now, right at this time of the year. We'll start raising the frames we're cutting now. We currently have an operation in Berkshire, and we've worked out at my place in Middlesex. We're pretty full in Middlesex. We have nowhere near this much room. We have eight piles of Middlesex. So we're shipping timber frames down to middle to Versher to store them, which is crazy. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it it would be the case that in May, let us say, we'd have our most we'd be full full of, full of timber. Maybe we have a few piles in our loading area. We hope not, but it's entirely possible. And then. August, there would be very you know, a bunch of those piles might not exist. And it's just wood with the metal top on it, right? And then the, whatever material you use to, to band it together. That's right, yeah. Uh, and then some of the wood is oil treated, but is it, um, is there? What kind of runoff is created? Well, I, not really any. The piles are built. Typically, we just build. We use timber offcuts, and then cribbing mm -hmm. as the base for a pile. We're not building, found, you know, digging, <coughs> building foundations. So we're just doing that on on the grass, uh, and then the metal roof. We don't want any water getting onto our oil timbers. I say oiled timbers uh, choose to use a, a product called Heritage Natural Finish on all of our timber frames. So it's, it's basically got beeswax, pine turpentine in it, uh, tongue oil, and I can't think of the other thing. But we, we're not having that running off. Uh, that would be real bad news for us to have timbers getting wet. So it's rain falling on the roof of the pile and landing on the earth around it. Okay, it just it, one of the things it looked like from at least the roof, it looked like it, that would cover largely the pile, but it wasn't like an overhang or anything. We intend them to overhang a little bit. So okay. indeed, what we've taken to doing, because it's a lot of tin moving, we now make a small roof that we can just pick up with our forklift. 
So it's uh, and we build the the piles are four feet wide. Typically, for those roofs are shown at six feet wide, so that you don't want sunlight hitting the timbers to the extent that you can avoid it. It's really there is much about protecting the timbers from the sun as they are about protecting them from rain, uh, and so they we we want those roofs to hang over the ends of the piles by about a foot and the sides of the piles by about a foot is ideal. So the black thing you're seeing is actually six feet by 20 feet in the case of all of these and about 30 feet in the case of those. And the pile underneath is actually only four feet by. And is it one of these things where, where you move it in, you were describing it, that the timber comes in at one, at one point in time and then you would bring it into the manufacturing treat it, cut it, then you would restack it, and then it doesn't get touched until the crane comes and moves it off site. That's the dream. Exactly. <laughs> right now, we move them a lot. Uh, okay. And then, why is that? Is it because well, because right now we're trying to stack things more densely in our constrained situation. So we're building five foot wide piles because we only have 50 foot piles, but the truck can only handle a four foot wide pile. And you end up re taking apart piles and rebuilding them so they'll fit nicely on the crane truck and just add them in. I presume that's an expense to you that you'd like yes, to avoid. We'd maybe. like to avoid that, yeah. Um, and when the, the wood comes in, it's untreated, just raw wood. Mostly eastern white pine, hemlock, sometimes white oak, and cherry. We don't do cherry quite a bit, but it's just raw wood. We saw it, almost all of it coming from Vermont forests. The bulk of all timber is coming from a soil in West Middlebury, some from a guy in our area. And when it's treated, is there an odor to the wood? Uh, the the, uh, the finish that we use mm -hmm. smells like, uh, it's got the thinner that's in it is citrus thinner, so it smells kind of like orange peels. It's quite a nice smell, actually. The wood itself, pine smell, well, those woods have a smell, but not a strong smell. No way anyone would ever smell any of that if it was right. Indeed, you'd have to get right up and put your nose on the timbers to smell. But if you came in the shop when we were putting oil on the timbers, you'd know who it is because you kind of go out their head as you walk in the finish. But like, you wouldn't be able to smell it from even a few feet away from a pile. Do any other board members have any questions so far? Sorry, Tom, I got distracted oh. on the basis, basic information. Um, any other questions about the, the wood piles? I think I've worked that, playing that one to death. Um, let's talk about the light manufacturing. Um, so the <coughs> you're proposing the, ma the main shop in front of the loading area. Give me a description about what the shop is going to look like. Hours of operation, noise, you know, the sawdust pumping out of the, the place or you know, what's it going to be, what, what is the impact that it's going to have? Yep, so um, this is what the shop would look like. The uh, This is the end of the shop that would be facing away from the road. So there's elevations here, maybe difficult for you to see. This is the elevation facing the road, the western face of the building. The office wing is on the north end of the building. These are giant sliding doors that open to allow us to just drive a load of timber right into the shop. Uh, we are built. We intend to build this with uh, two by six framing, dense packed cellulose, two by ten rafters, dense packed cellulose, uh, energy efficient windows and doors. All these things add up to a tight envelope that is very like it'd be hard to hear noise from inside the shop fairly well sound insulated. Um, we intend to put dust collection in, in the shop that will dump into a bin right here, but the nature of the work is that we're primarily working in green timber. And the tools that we use to do that don't generate fine dust the way a cabinet shop is generating fine dust. They, the, um, because the wood is wet, chain mortisers, the, the saws that we have, large and few teeth, so the dust tends to just fall to the ground as opposed to being a real airborne issue. Um, 
So wherever practical, we like to collect that dust right at the source. So if someone is using a router, we would like to you know, hook them a vacuum right up to that that's got a heat filter on it. We're doing that to protect ourselves, but it has the added benefit of keeping our shop clean and eliminating any dust that will uh, make its way into the environment. Um, so I don't anticipate that a person on the road would experience this as an amazing operation. The uh, happy is working inside that nice big shop. That's why we want to build it. And, uh, and uh, the door that would be open for loading uh, timber is facing the knoll. There are no houses any, anywhere near in that direction. So it's uh, except for ones you're seeking to except the ones we're seeking to build. And, uh, and they're quite protected by the knoll itself, actually. So not, I hope, since I might consider living in one of them, the, uh, it certainly wouldn't be any worse than my current situation. Which is above the, 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 the tent, <laughs> the wall tent is in the front yard, yeah. Um, so when you describe the, the power tools, just so I can under, have a sense, are we talking about sort of handheld tools for the most part? You're not talking about big sort of industrial saws or? We, ultimately, we would like to have a stationary table saw, joiner, planer, because we make jigs and we, we make other small items in the course of our work. The bulk of what we do involves actual handheld tools. They're big tools. They're 20 amp timber framing tools, but they are As, as opposed to say like a, uh, a sawmill or something where you would have a large, right. quite noisy saw. Right, or a 10 horsepower shaper or a remoting machine. Um, and is this, is this air conditioned so that in the summer the doors would stay closed or is the idea to open the doors in the summer? Well, it's designed so that we get a really good solar gain in the winter time. Mm -hmm. And then the overhangs are generous enough so that by the time you get to the middle of May, the sun doesn't hit those windows. So I don't, we have a guy who's really worried about this. He's, he's quite out of it. But he's, he's worried about it. And I've pointed out to him that in the summertime, it's not going to get a lot of solar gain. However, the heat system that we propose to install is a semi-insulated space. And the way that, the reason that is true is that we don't need to keep it at 70 degrees like an office. And so what we're intending to do is heat that with mini split heat pumps, which allow you air conditioning as well as to heat. So if it actually is hot in the summer, which I doubt, then we'll turn that into a split heat pump. Okay. And, and what are the hours of operation that you're proposing? Is this Typically, um, <coughs> we're an eight to five sort of an operation. Sometimes people would like to come in a little early, but that are that is our general. When you say a little early, do you mean like seven? Or? Yeah. Um, and if there was just just because there are, and I'm not sure, if there, are there residences across the street from this property? Jesse is directly, well, your driveway is directly across the street. Yeah. So if there was a condition, for example, that, you know, nothing, nothing before seven, nothing after um, a certain hour um, in the evening uh, for noise, would that create an issue? Uh, we, well, I, I, I guess mean, what I would prefer is to know that we can't violate some noise requirement at the road. Like, there's definitely people who occasionally want to start their day early because they have kids and they have to take off at two to pick up their kids school, what have you, um, if they were making noise that was disturbing the neighborhood, that would be an issue. But if they're working in the shop and we can't hear it completely from the road, that seems it's, an, it, un an unnecessary concern. Yeah, we have a, we have a noise ordinance that we take care of. We do. Um, the, the, other, the only other thing would be the question would be on the lighting of the public facility that it takes in. Mm -hmm. uh, but to ask a business owner to say, can we roughly between 
six events. And then someone who was, I, 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 I just would be opposed. Okay. Uh, I'm just simply floating it out. And, they, and the only reason I, I simply wanted to understand as well, if, and I think it's a legitimate answer to say you have people that come in early, um, but obviously <coughs> they're incompatible. What we're trying to avoid is incompatible uses where, you know, it, the buzz saw starts screaming at six in the morning and the other the people across the street are trying to keep baby asleep. Maybe um, you ought to get Adam down there to tell them about it. <laughs> well, not enough town that everybody talks to everybody and there's enough this is, this is true, but you know, not we have off business we, for, for this kind of stuff. Okay, <clears throat> well, we'll get through this point. Um, but I, I think just trying to understand. So this is this is helpful, and you know, uh, the other parts of it too is uh, just trying to understand if somebody's showing up to work early. It's it, it sounds like it's different. It's not as if the full manufacturing is going full bore at six in the morning. It's one no. one person who's coming in a little bit early to get his or her work done. Timo really likes to start early. Okay, um, and that's a legitimate point and um, I mean is it is it something where you know in the evening hours especially in certain times of year there may have to work later just to meet deadlines that happens to us you know. how many people work there there are They'll now work. seven people living in Montpelier who would like to be based in this shop okay. yeah. so as, as we continue to just understand the the scale of any potential impact if there were seven tools running at the exact same moment, that's the maximum. You would not have ten tools running with seven people. And so, like, unless you've got some really good people, but um, so even that is, is not a ton, a ton of noise from what I from your descriptions of, of how it operates. I mean, I'd wear protection if I was in there, but yeah, you definitely need to wear protection. <laughs> so, do you have a an original facility? That'll keep operating, and this will be a secondary location. Yep. Same product for both places. That that remains to be seen. How we can best. Yeah. We talk about it all the time. Should Bercher just be the kiosk land? Should we try to keep both shops doing everything? I, I don't have a clear answer for that, but yeah, at the moment the intention is there are two shops that can support one another. Mm -hmm. What, what would you say, if you could estimate this, is the latest that the shop might be running? I don't, it's really uncommon for us to be like running the shop after six. What's not, uh, wouldn't shock me is sometime in the summer you have a deadline you have to meet and you end up working in the evening or you end up loading in the evening. Yeah, which loading is not a particularly noisy operation. So um, let's talk about lighting, and, and some of this is spilling over into the sort of major site plan, but I think that's the other big category, and then what we'll do is we'll jump into some of the uh, specifics in the staff report as well. Um, could you describe the lighting proposal for this site? Sure. Do you mean the interior or the exterior? Uh, exterior. exterior. Less concerned about the interior. Sure. So um, the exterior lighting is really quite minimal here. What we have are uh, a couple of fully shielded decent lights over the person doors at the western side, which face the road. And, um, and then we have three of those same light fixtures here. There's one of them underneath the entry on the north side. And all of those fixtures are, uh, each of those fixtures is like 1,200 lumens. They're fully shielded, directed straight down. And, uh, and then in addition to that, we have one floodlight right up here. This is on the end of the building that faces the knoll, so pointing away from the road, illuminates the loading area that is behind the building. That fixture is 8,000 lumens, and uh, I propose to orient it at a 45 degree angle down. The ordinance states that all floodlights must be oriented 45 degrees or lower. The ordinance also states that all lighting over 2,000 lumens has to be fully shielded. That would be pointing that floodlight straight down. 
could be completely ineffective for us to point that flood light straight down and there's only no illumination out in the loading area. I could, within the zone, like my total uh, lighting here amounts to I think 1,600 lumens per acre. The limit is 50,000. So we're way under the limited lighting. The photometric plan that uh, Green Mountain Electrical Supply created for us, I believe you have a copy in here, shows you that the lighting levels drop to zero well before you reach the road or either of the neighbors. So uh, it would be within our, um, we would be well, well within the zoning limits if we were to put a series of telephone poles around our staging area and put giant lights pointing straight down. We could, we could light it up like a, a baseball field. That would be offensive, I think, to our neighbors. This light, no neighbor can see it. It's protected by eaves. It's on the back side of the building. You guys wouldn't be able to see it. The other neighbors that are across on the hill would not be able to see that light picture. They would see the, that the ground was illuminated in the staging area. This is one of the points where we're asking the DRB to uh, waive the requirement for that flood that would be pointing straight down because it wouldn't, it wouldn't serve the purpose that, it, that, that the light is meant to serve. So um, I think that's, that's the, we don't have a big right. exterior lighting impact. That's the one question. Are the, I want to address that in a second, but I have a, just another question I don't want to lose sight of. Is there any lighting proposed for the signage that you're proposing as well on the front? I suggested that we would have an LED rope light powered by photovoltaics. Okay. And that LED rope light would run on the underside of that little loop. Yeah. This would be very low level of illumination. Sure. We've dealt with those in other times. What would the, uh, the, to both the gooseneck light and the, and the flood light, what type of light? Uh, you have the actual specifications for the fixtures. And it says LED available. Oh yeah, no. Uh, so we're required, the, the building has to meet the stretch code. So I've been in conversation with the fellow from Efficiency Vermont. Is, is that what you're asking about the energy usage of the? No, I'm just asking the type of lighting. Oh, it'd be an LED bulb inside LED. that. And there, it, the fixture is itself, you can't change the bulbs. It's not like we could take it out, but in some other. Right, no. All, in all cases, that fixture, when it when the bulb burns out, you have to get a fixture. Mm -hmm. So it's are the, are the, is the lighting color corrected? Uh, the specifications are actually highlighted. I don't know the answer to that. There, I specifically would choose the warmest light I could get. So I like that, um, but I don't know about the color corrected question. There is a. It's all night sky compliant. <laughs> One of them, Kevin, had the, the RAB. This is the flood light. That's the flood light. That yeah. sheet talked about color consistency, color stability, and color uniformity on the left hand column. Um, just so I fully understand the, the flood light, so this is this flood light is it's not for security, it's not for general use, it's for when you need to illuminate the, the, the loading area right. or. Activity. Right. So it's it's not a you wouldn't have it on necessarily every day. No. Um, and this would really serve a particular purpose. Truck comes in to unload or load after the sun goes down. You need this to illuminate that area. Indeed, in the wintertime at about four, <laughs> yeah. you need that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. To be to work safely out there. Yeah. Right. And and. I'm just uh, trying to understand, you know, because I think what you're what you're saying is is that, um, sure, you could put a series of light posts out there that would be consistent with the the zoning bylaws, um, but one, it's an expense you don't wish to incur, and two, it doesn't really serve the ultimate the the purpose that you're proposing, which is you need to illuminate a specific area for a period of time to perform work and it's not like the light posts like you know in the Department of Labor that are there for security safety and are constantly on every evening when cars come in and out this is a, a work specific light right yeah that's right is that I would not put that light on a motion detector these lights are much more they're very low level but I would want to be able to leave them on for security reasons that's 
that's not a security light. That's a, oh, we got to unload a trailer. Turn off the light. Right. I mean, that's helpful because I think that, that, you know, because we're part of the reason why these zoning bylaws exist and why these lighting requirements exist is to avoid um, situations where, you know, because it is, it's always cheaper to put a big spotlight to illuminate an area as opposed to light posts. Um, and we've had issues, for example, with the, the hotel uh, on Morrisfield Street yeah. that wanted to do that. Um, and, you know, the zoning bylaws don't really contemplate that type of spotlighting because it creates that big impact. But what you're saying is that this is in facing the back. It's, it's, you've got the, the aluminum chart, but I think what's really distinguishing this is that this is a very work specific piece of, of equipment. It's almost as if, you know, part of the tool, tools that you use, um, as opposed to a, a general lighting concept or fixture. It wouldn't be on a whole lot, right? I think to answer your, I think that's mature. No, no, I'm ju I'm just just sort of making sure that I understand the the concept, and, and if I'm wrong, correct me. But good. I was late to your right. Um, any other questions about lighting, Kate? Yes, um, on page three desk. Dash 64 of the new ordinance, which we're all getting familiar with. Um, class 2 lighting, initial output of less than 2,000 lumens. It, I think there's a caveat about lighting being extinguished after 11 p.m. if the light's more than 50 feet from the nearest building. Am I am I reading that correctly? So, meaning it, the, um, the spotlight could be on as needed, the way that you've described it, but there would be some sort of timer or a short, you know, turning it off to assure that it's not on after 11 p.m left on by mistake or something like that. But I guess my first question is, is that what the ordinance calls for? On you're, you're on 3-64. 64, and, and under which, which section? Yeah, so three, this is three considered 3204H. 3204H, security lighting, figure 3-21. We're talking about what we call class two lighting in zone one. And then as I read this table, there is a requirement for class two lighting for it to be extinguished after 11 p.m. I just want to know if I'm interpreting that correctly. I think this is, I guess what I would say is that this is not a, um, this is not a security light. But it, it's the, a, the big, the big floodlight. The other one. Class two doesn't delineate security lights. It delineates a whole class of lights that includes outdoor security, equipment yards, parking lots, roadways, walkways. Um, page, page 13 of our staff report kind of orients us toward the, the scheme. Yeah, I think the question that would come up on that one, and I don't remember a direct conversation that the Planning Commission had on this, but reading it, if you're talking about lights that are on the building, Mm -hmm. If the light is located more than 50 feet from the nearest building, I don't know if that's oh. referring to lighting that would be, say, out in the middle of a parking lot and away oh. from buildings. And I was reading that as 50 feet from the nearest neighbor. The if it's attached building. to the building, it may not be. Yeah, germane. I don't know 100% the in intent, because I don't remember this one coming up. Yeah. I don't remember in seven years of discussions, <laughs> my four years, where this uh, would have specifically been called out. But I think it may just be that it's referring to those lights that are away from the buildings to get turned off. Thank you, and thank you. Okay. Any other questions about lighting? If not, what's the pleasure of the board if I can suggest um, that we go through the staff report um, for some of the kind of take it out of order and suggest that we start with the conditional use standards just because that's where our discussion has been primarily um, just to make sure that we have those covered and that starts at page 21 of the staff report
so in the interest of sort of keeping the, the process moving, there's a number of conditional use standards in our, our zoning bylaw. Not all of them are, are implicated by this project. So to the extent that um, they're not, um, the staff has indicated, and I'll just simply go over those briefly. It talks about capacity of community facilities and utilities. It says the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed development shall not cause a disproportionate unreasonable burden on C's ability to provide community facilities and utilities including local schools, police, fire protection, ambulance, street infrastructure and maintenance, park and recreation facilities, water supply, sewage disposal, stormwater systems and infrastructure. Now, um, it does not seem that any of those are implicated by this particular project. It doesn't affect the schools, police and fire, parks and recreation. The next section is traffic um, this, this is talking about the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed development will not have an undue adverse impact upon traffic in the area including the volume type of timing of traffic that the traffic generated by the proposed development shall not have reasonably disproportionately contribute to reduced level of services that the reasonable measures have been taken to minimize or mitigate the amount of vehicular traffic generated by proposed development So there are some comments from the Director of Public Works uh, concerning the proposed driveway. Have you had an opportunity to review those? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Don, have you, are you working with the project or are you? Okay. Okay. So, I mean, the comments really seem to be about the proposed driveway. They're satisfied that meets the B-71 standard. Um, and then they're based on the written description of the internal truck circulation arrangements and representation concerning truck access needs. We believe the proposed Washington driveway design with two curb cuts is both justifiable and appropriate in this case. Um, how much traffic is this project generating on a daily basis? I, um, I would say eight trips in the morning where I work. Timber delivery involves, for the most part, at moment, uh, a, a large pickup truck that's pulling trucks into a trailer, and then that that delivery of the finished product involves a large crane truck that's pulling up the truck. So it's both more part of the picture. And it looks like a tractor trailer plate seat. It's equivalent to a tractor trailer in terms of the size. So the, the idea would be for the big trucks to come through at the southern entrance and then come out the northern, or? Yeah, I think that the best approach, if I were driving a big truck, and, uh, and I'm usually just driving a pickup with a trailer, but I would think come in here, load up, and leave. So uh, any questions from the board about traffic? Yep. You have questions? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> um, when you're moving piles around, I assume that that is entirely taking place entirely internal to the site. Those vehicles don't exit and come back on. Right. Okay. So that's all inside. Um, the reason I ask is that when I first looked at the anticipated um, trips each day, both the residential or imagining the residential, but also employees, also deliveries. I thought, wow, there doesn't seem to be really that much opportunity for a lot of conflict between arriving staff, the one or two trips a week, and the one or two trips out a month. And so the just that was listed in a couple of places as a justification for the two curb cuts yeah. to avoid conflicts between the residential traffic and the site traffic. Um, it still doesn't seem to me like there's a great conflict between those? Is it more the moving around internal that is something you want to internal, avoid? And, and it's really nice if you don't have to make somebody in a large truck back up. At certain times of the year, it's not that big a deal, but you get mm -hmm. into the winter when there's snow all around, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it's not hard to imagine getting that guy stuck. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to imagine getting him stuck in a bad place, and all of a sudden, 
the residents can't leave before. Mm -hmm. So that's the. So then the last uh, conditional use that we have to consider uh, is the character of the neighboring stakeholders. And this simply says that the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed development shall not have an undue adverse effect upon the character of the neighborhood. So you presented um, testimony that basically a lot of <coughs> the activity of the shop is directed towards the back, towards the river. And the knoll, as opposed to out Elm Street in the residential areas next door. I'll note that to the north of you is Pearl Street Motors, which is a commercial use, and then to the south of you is the uh, the tree company, the tree service, the tree service that has trucks coming in and out, bucket trucks and chippers. We do some firewood cutting up there too, I believe. Living. Is that also a residence there at Vermont Tree Experts? Yeah, yeah. Both, both those are residences and well, this uh, yes. yeah. okay. um, Any other questions about that? Well, I bring that up simply because establishing uh, the already uh, established uses of the area and how this would fit in with a, uh, with a use that uh, uh, is probably a little more benign, but right along the same character. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would ask a question related to the use. I mean, so th this is clearly an opera a manufacturing operation as opposed to a place where people come for classes to learn how to do timber framing or that is a showroom or a build your own, any sort of activity. That is the case uh, for what you're proposing at present? Right. It's not Home Depot. You take classes at Home Depot? We can. Enough time, That's um. true. You should see my house. Um, uh, thank you. I just uh, make note of that since that would be a different type of use and probably necessitate coming back if you, if you ever change the way that the site is used and interact with your customers and potential future customers. We do interact with customers, but not very often. More for sort of consultations and right. this is what we build. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I don't include it in our trip count because currently I would say that we have a customer visit definitely not even once a week. So it happens, but it's not, we're not a retail operation. Thank you for confirming that. Not that there's anything wrong with retail, but location, location, location. We'd love it if more people drop by, and we expect that they will, but I still don't think that they have much of a bear on traffic. When you're a place like a showroom, but the entire shop is a showroom. Okay. I hope that people come and visit it and say, wow, that's beautiful. Would you build us a house? The shop is gorgeous. I definitely hope that that's the, it is. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's a showroom. Your, your secret's out. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about conditional use? <clears throat> so let's yes. let's jump into the general um, the major site plan review. Um, and again, there's a lot of issues in this staff report. Have you had an opportunity to review? I said no. Five by five. Okay. So I mean. Most of them, I think we've answered by our pretty thorough review of, of the conditions of use. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of points, but at any point, the board feels an issue hasn't been touched. Let me know. Um, just going under Chapter 300 with the general standards, um, the proposed office use, uh, because this is a rural district, office use is not allowed. So one of the conditions that would be Potentially put on this project is that the office use is an accessory to the, the timber frame business so that if for some reason you decided to get into paper pushing instead of timber framing, um, you might not be able to use this site in the same way. Um, the office is ancillary to your timber framing or light industry business. Is that any plans that you have coming down? Doesn't bother me at all. Okay. I find it a bizarre rule. Like, why would you not want <laughs> some high tech offices out in the rural part of Montpelier? I don't understand. Do you want, you want them downtown? To do with us. I don't care at all. Yeah, that. I. <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> such thoughts. But that 
that's another day. Yeah. <laughs> we can revisit that. Yeah, that, that and certainly if Amazon had uh, had answered our bid, we might be having a different conversation. I suppose um, I can see that point. Okay. But um, all right, and then uh, one of the other staff comments is about erosion control. There's a section 3008 that requires you to implement erosion control, particularly because you know you are close to the river. Do you have, is there any problem adopting those erosion control practices as part of if we make those conditional on your permit? Not at all. I don't, okay. I'm <laughs> yeah. Speaking to my engineer. Because the project will be served by the local, mm -hmm. the jurisdiction by the agency where construction's going on, and this would be you do a scoring for those, this project would score in the low risk, so that the low risk by meeting the state's stormwater permit, you'll have met, met the city erosion control. And that's consistent with what we found before. Um, moving forward, and I'm, I'm really just hitting the points that have been raised for us. The uh, sign. Um, so if I understand, there's one wall-mounted sign then there are two, two, two freestanding signs. One freestanding. One freestanding. So where is the, the wall-mounted sign is, is going to be on the Elm Street facing side of the thing? It's right in the middle of the table or in the face of the It's right there. It's 13 feet, two and a half inches in grade to the top of the sign. The sign is 10 feet wide. It may not be on, well, I think it is on yours, but the dimensions are within what you're talking about. That's what's missing is the dimension. We have on the freestanding sign. Right, you have the not on the, we have everything on the freestanding. What we didn't have was the information on like how high it's, it was shown on his drawings, but I didn't have the dimension to know. One foot by, sorry. It's one foot by ten feet. Coincidentally, exactly the size of the permit. Sometimes it works out that way. Um, and is there any illumination that's going to go over that? No. Okay. Mike told me that if I wanted to turn it into a piece of stained glass, I could cut a hole in the building and make it a window. Mm -hmm. And if there was lights on inside, it would illuminate it. And that would be my goal. That would be. Yeah. It sounds pretty expensive. I don't think I would. <laughs> can also put loose necks on it. They're not on there right now. I'd have to You'd revise have my request, wouldn't I? You would. I don't want to add loose necks. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> uh, I presume that down the road that could be done. I, I don't say anything on the fly anymore. Okay. That's <laughs> probably the best. Um, and so then, uh, well, I mean, are you talking about, right now you've got two goosenecks on the Elm Street side um, over the doorways. And so you would be proposing to add two over your 10-foot sign. I'd make it three if I was going to do it. Only because I love odd numbers. And there's three windows right above it. Triple thing. It's better than double things. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Um, what's the question? Well, if if uh, the applicant wanted to add three gooseneck points over his sign. No, we're not. We're not. Yeah, we're 
where was that coming in? Is it just me around the time of the year? I think that's just lighting and brightness. Uh, We'd have to make a finding that it wouldn't impact on our production. What would you have to ask for? It has, in a way, the applicant allowed to ask for it at this juncture? Well, that's, a, that's my point. Yeah, I think that's the only reason why there's a question on the floor now. Right. If it was, if it had been included in his application, then yeah. we wouldn't, wouldn't even be, be reviewing it. Right. I can't believe that is. He's got a plan here. It's perfectly in our game. Well, that's I, all I'm trying to do, Jack, is avoid creating a headache for him down the road. I understand, but he's he's probably created his own headache in this by putting together a plan like this. Tyler Nolly comes back and sees the city officials to get that done. Sorry. That's not our job. I believe it is that. Unless anybody else. Um, and then just to be clear, the Timber Home Vermont, the freestanding sign that we've shown the dimensions on, that's the one where you have the strip of LED lights. Alright. Um, conclude no no lighting or lighting or will we add that just to the condition when we get to the condition to clarify it? What's what was what? I don't know. I think we have not heard a request from the applicant that, that there's a desire for a condition for lighting so that it could be handled administratively, but I don't want to put words in the applicant's mouth. <coughs> the applicant doesn't know what to say. <laughs> Should we take five? Or not. No. no, I mean, this is this is just, I mean, I may have opened this door um, inadvertently. inadvertently. I, I might use different words than our friend Jack here, but I, I, I think my sentiments are, are the same. But let's just let, let it be. Let it be. If you should so desire lighting in the future, what you feel can still be done. It seems that it would be simple and straightforward to come back and talk to Mike and rectify that and it wouldn't necessarily require the whole the carpet carpentry. Minor site plan. Okay. Okay. Moving on. Uh, next point is about bicycle parking. Um, the question is, should the, um, the applicant be required to provide bike lanes on Elm Street? Um, the city's complete street plan doesn't propose bike lanes out this far, but instead requires a paved shoulder which already exists. Although not required, the DPW director recommends that the developer consider developing association documents, especially for the residential lots to outline the operations and maintenance plans for shared facilities. So Mike, is this point really about internal bike circulation or is this about Elm Street bike circulation? It's on page 11. Okay, so. So the, the first one, I think, is, is kind of a no-brainer, but um, just the way the ordinance was worded, there was a requirement that Well, this is yeah. under this is under three two zero two B, which talks about all developments should provide safe and convenient pedestrian access in accordance with the following. And then it talks about public sidewalks, uh, internal walkways, parking area, and alternative transportation operation maintenance plans. So the the first part of the comments that I provided was really that there were there was some reference to having a requirement, just like there's a requirement for sidewalks, there's a clear exception in the rules that say if there's no sidewalks, you don't have to connect on uh -huh. sidewalks. But there isn't that 
phrasing for the bike lanes. And so theoretically, if the DRB wanted to, they could require bike lanes for the frontage that they have out there. My thought would be it doesn't make any sense. I, um, it's not called out in our complete streets plan to put bike lanes out this far, so I certainly wouldn't expect that we would, but they're yeah, always there. <laughs> they're oh, yeah. paved shoulders, I it's not a bike lane. No, they're signed bike lanes all the way to Boulder. So I think it's a non-issue. Okay, maybe a non-issue then. It's, yeah, I've biked there. It's one of the best parts of Elm Street as in terms of the nice wide shoulder. So. It has the little bike logos. Oh, so those are just Sharrows. Those are, are those considered dedicated bike lanes? I'm not sure, they're not. Um, but the bike on the on the shoulder is not a dedicated bike. Okay, well, strange. Who knew? Different, different Who definitions knew? of stuff. Yeah. Uh, it functions as a bike lane. That's what matters. I don't think you need to do anything. Yeah. What what uh, Tom was referring to, DPW director, was internally his concern was um, that the developer considered developing association documents, especially for the residential lots, to outline the operation and maintenance of shared facilities like roads, the wells, and septic system. Um, so, at least we worry, and we haven't really talked about it because it's sorry, permanent. We've got three three homes there, but it's one lot. Presumably, you're building. Have you built? You're going to build the homes out there. DPW's concern is that more normally you know, people build homes like this, they're, they're kind of like the alphabet port to subdivide because nobody wants to just buy a house on somebody else's property and come down their own, uh, their own slice of time. And uh, given that you're going to be sharing a lot of facilities here, I think what DPW is suggesting is that at some point in time you need a homeowner association as to how you're going to pay for repayment. We have, we have every intention of generating. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessary for this permit. It doesn't strike me as, I mean, I think that's something that's that's going to necessarily follow. Yeah, I don't, I don't I'm not sure we have the authority. That's not going to see the court for several days. Well, I mean, I think there is, we could require as far as like circulation. I mean, obviously not the, the point, homeowner, yep. not the larger homeowner association, but certainly for circulation and some uh, flow of traffic within the site, within the house. We could make a condition on that, work it out. Um, but I don't see that as an issue. I have no, I have no, no desire to add that. Um, There's a lighting question, which we've already talked about. Um, the only other question. The one other question. Two, two, two other questions. questions. But the fencing. Yep. So if you turn to page 18, um, this, whether um, whether fencing is going to be required here. Uh, and this comes under. Outdoor store. This comes under the section three two zero five outdoor seating display or storage. It says outdoor storage, the keeping of any materials, goods, equipment, unregistered vehicles, or other items not for sale in any unroofed areas for more than twenty four hours may be allowed as accessory use in accordance with the following: one, the site plan shows the location and boundaries of the outdoor storage area. Two, the outdoor storage areas shall not be located within required setbacks. Three, except in Eastern Gateway Districts, outdoor storage areas shall not be located between the principal building and the street unless approved by the DRB. Um, and four, outdoor storage areas shall be fenced in and screened from view from the street and surrounding properties. So you very testified that you're planning on screening the front of these um, storage areas, correct? With the, the sort of living willow fence, which it, just to make sure I understand, are you talking about a fence where you build like a sort of mesh, like 
wire netting that the willows would grow up in between and then sort of become a wooden wall, or are you just talking about planting a wall of willow, willows? Basically planting a wall of willows. You drive some stakes in, as I understand it, to train those. Mm -hmm. that when it's a hedge, really, I mean, you call it anything. There's a company that specializes in these things in the hedging space. You know, deer feed for things they eat to certain age. But, uh, yeah. So I think this is up to our discretion as to whether we require any fencing beyond what's been proposed. I don't think we necessarily, I don't think you need to. Okay. I think the uh, screen is good enough. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. 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 One of the other comments was that the DRE should require the submission of an energy certificate prior to occupancy as a condition of approval. Is the town secure already seeking it? I believe we have to do that to get a building permit. Right. That's my understanding. I think we have just gone through it in our review process. That's it. Any other questions as to the major site plan? There's a couple of proposed conditions, and I just want to go through them with the board. Um, let's talk about the, the office, because they're not allowed as a primary use in a rural district and only allowed as an accessory use. Um, what's the board's? Uh, pleasure as far as making this just simply a condition that if the primary light industrial use ceases, so would the office. I don't think we have to have it as a condition because that's what the ordinance says. Why do we have to have it as a condition if the ordinance prohibits it? We sometimes specify conditions related to soil erosion, even though the ordinance specifies that as well. This isn't soil erosion, it's the office. I know, but I'm saying that that's an analogous example where we put something in the conditions that is in the ordinance that, they're, that is supposed to be done anyway. Uh, I, I personally, I'm with, uh, with your, Roger's view on this. So we can shape it more as a finding, just simply that we find it to be an accessory use yeah. as, opposed to making it a, as opposed to making it a condition with the idea that if there comes to some point um, down the road, where the zoning bylaws change, he's not hamstrung with a condition that he has to somehow give up an office use and his primary use changes where it's allowable otherwise under the bylaws. Okay. Uh, the applicant shall follow the erosion control practices. I think that's already been um, addressed and that doesn't seem to be an issue, um, but we tend to make those conditions as well. The applicant shall provide the missing sign if already provide the missing side information. The landscaping shall be maintained in a healthy condition. Dead or dying plants shall be replaced within one growing season with a comparable plant in terms of type, form, size, of maturity, etc. of at least the minimum size requirements specified in figure 3-20. Um, that's sort of our normal language as to, um, you know, especially given that you're having this edge um, that uh, is going to provide a major screening component so that if there are problems, it doesn't prove salt tongue, it doesn't prove deer tongue, um, you would replace that. Yep. Uh, the applicant shall provide revised lighting. You know, well, that, that's the issue about the lighting for the, uh, for the what's called spotlight, but it's floodlight. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? We had a long discussion about that. I'm satisfied that the uh, uh, applicant has uh, um, described the, the use of the spotlight um, and uh, I don't think it should be fully shielded. And I would also add to that that it's the rear of the building. It's the rear, yeah. It's not going to affect uh, the <coughs> highway in any, in any way, fashion, nor should it affect neighbors from right. the location where it would be. In other words, I, th I think it's important to specify that uh, because going forward with the new ordinance, we don't want to give the impression that a spotlight is you know, at this intensity is uh, is okay in all locations. 
I agree with these re with this reasoning and these arguments, and I would ask Mike um, where our authority is to to do this. Is it within the waiver provision? Is it that broad? The the waiver provision isn't that broad, um, and as we're going through, we've, I, you know, we've obviously been flagging mm -hmm. issues where giving more discretion to the board gives you guys more flexibility to make mm -hmm. individual decisions. Yeah, this is certainly um, one of those areas where the discretion makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it certainly is, um, you know, looking at, certainly looking at the whole, the amount, the overall total light output, the light, other light fixtures, it's a single light fixture that's only on during specific times. Um, it, there isn't a specific, as I would say, a specific out for the DRB, but um, we have notes to that effect. Um, and uh, there was another comment that the applicant uh, potential condition that the applicant shall address any design concerns outlined in the Department of Public Works director's comments above regarding the sight lines and the applicant's construction and access permit with the city. Um, and that's just simply the B-71 standards making sure that there are sight lines that uh, would address those with the DBW and work those out <clears throat> before you started construction. And that that would happen on the um, task force and the other is another boilerplate that any future enlargement alterations or change of use to require permit from the city of Toronto. That you got what you applied for and it's if you want more you can come back and we'll be happy to give you ready to go to Walmart a little. Yeah. Could use next time so give us um it's a pleasure of the board. I can recommend public public. What? Public? Do you want to go public or do you no, want to go? Need, oh, sorry. Public, public comment. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. <laughs> You're sitting here at the table. Does anyone have any comments that they wish to address the board? So if you could just state your name and. My name is Tom Boyer. I live across the room on the other side. Yeah. Could you go to the uh, microphone, please? I would be affected probably by lights and. I just want to touch on the purpose of the rural uh, district. The rural district is compromised mainly in water development, the rural residential agriculture, as far as the production of children for conservation and other natural resources. Generally, the rural district does not serve their kids for the light location of the common purpose of the district is to maintain low density.
the land. We're looking at the new regulations. You, you applied, and this was a, applied for as a, as a commercial venture by a, a company to build three homes. The zoning changed since then. Now, instead of going to, well, here, I'll go back to the right-tool section. There is a requirement. 
in there specifically states it only states this in the rightful section eight district and the eastern rural district are the only two districts where it actually talks about and let me go up to that uh, eastern rural district and i'll just uh cut down a few sentences this this under undeveloped land remains in large parcel a proposed land development should discourage fragmentation of this land following conservation uh, subdivision principle for cluster development while protecting large tracts of open space for conservation, forestry, farming, and recreation use. Only says that in the Eastern Rural District and in the Riceville District. Somehow now we're making a jump from approval of three home sites that's pushed way back in right off the floodplain, which I think contradict what we should be working in order to be developing. Now, we're looking to piggyback that in, because apparently what Mike is informing us is that because they didn't split this into three lots yet, but I don't know, I think I find that confusing because we refer to lots, and Mike even referred to it in his staff report, he refers to figure 213, the rural district of dimensional standard. In there, it explains what a lot is. A lot is two acre minimum uh, frontage, 120 feet minimum, and coverage 20% max. These are things Mike relates to when he's trying to see if it puts it in the property. So we are referring to lots, even though technically it's not subdivided. We've now let a builder investor come in who has actually, he just testified earlier, he doesn't even know he's going to live there. He has a commercial venture with three homes that could be rentals. Sales, they can sell these at any time. But yet, you've avoided, when you have a four lot subdivision, you're required to do the uh, 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 conservation subdivision, print, you know, design principles. You, you know, four, you're supposed to do it in any district. But you also have these two districts, Eastern Rural and Riceville districts, that specifically have this written into it. The, the new regulations that this is what we should be looking at and this is what we're doing to protect the land and you saw this lot you saw the erosion it's, just, it's an issue we can't get back we can't pull back the land. you know I'm a, I'm a fan of timber framing I went to workshop two two authors will be in you probably know Jack Sylvan Jack Sylvan wrote a few books timber framing I'm a big fan they have barns and kids always love them and this isn't you know Attack towards that, but attack towards developers and developing. We have the two largest rural districts. That if we had developers coming in and, and, and taking this approach, and undermining the regulations we have, because you got lucky and you bought three lots and now it can be four. I don't think it's the city. The city is responsible to provide a free, you know, lot to somebody to put logs and everything else, affect drainage, water. As a commercial venture, I mean, if you come down, you head north from downtown Montpelier, and you head uh, north of Elm Street, the nearest business south of that is over a mile away. That's not educational, Turtle Island, uh, CCD, uh, Nature Center. These are all, you know, written in there, educational things that we want in our community. Timber framing that employs very few people. Has a lot of traffic, a lot of logs, all this stuff affects our, you know, uh, water quality possibly or whatever on, on land. Any impact on this land is it's incredible. I've been doing a lot of research into the, uh, the conservation design principles. And I think we're pretty liberal here in Vermont, or more relaxed, as I said, in some, some parts of the country. Conservation design principles are in, in most areas are to protect 50 to 70 percent of the buildable land. Buildable, they don't count flood plain. they don't count other stuff. It's designed the, the premise of that, right? Uh, what, what, what it was, originally we, we had cluster, uh, cluster uh, development, you know, which basically was a uh, very, uh, well, it was just simple to say, here, we got Three houses on this lot. And, uh, yeah, three houses on the lot. And, and 
conserving through 25% of your land. The conservation of dry goods is a little lot easier. It's more involved in protecting the rest of natural resources, both primary, secondary, and secondary species of the great green center. And, and the primary is, is to protect the waterways, the uh, floodplains, wetlands, um, stuff like that. The idea is that cluster development doesn't become an avenue to open some municipalities require that when you apply for uh, uh, conservation subdivision design, that you also have to apply the conventional design. Because as we know, you got a two acre minimum with a 120 foot minimum. This lot, 690 feet road, road road, would have to have four lots maxed at 172 feet. That's in a perfect world. 172 feet, you can't, you couldn't do on this regular shape very easily. It'd be very difficult. So, so Tom, I think this plan. Sorry, I, I, I don't mean to cut you off. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe focus just because we have a limited jurisdiction as a board, as a development review board, to make sure that I understand your, your comments. Your, mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I don't want to uh, at all put words in your mouth, but um, is it your concern is that the the proposed industrial use is inconsistent with the district? Very much so. Um, and then, you know, part of the problem, and we discussed this earlier, is that the three lot subdivision, it's not, sorry, the three lot, the, sorry, the three buildings that are permitted um, in the back have already been permitted. So yeah, we're not. No, I, am, I understand that, but we're looking for something, piggybacking now onto something. What? Uh, no, I just, I just wanted, yeah, no, I, I wanted to understand the, the context because it, it, you know, it's obvious that you understand, you know, we can't obviously take back. No, no, and I, I understand it, but now that we're looking for even more on top of all of that, I think you have to look at that. It is, it is obviously there's no commercial businesses in the area that don't have a house attached to it that's saleable as a house business to the area. Businesses that have been from if they're in Oakland County not in fact moving vehicles. I look for businesses on the road. Grove Street, I don't do much from them at all, but I'm still you know, I'm a city guy. Right. Most of it is like it was inside, right? I mean it's it's commercial building. Here we have a totally different breed of, of, of commercial business where it's, it's going to be a lot of outside work, a lot of movement on the other side, and, and a lot of this infrastructure, which a lot they talk about the conservation uh, subdivision design, is that you have to count the extras and the roads. You have to count all the imprint needed because that land is now not in the, you know, what it's going to be for drainage. So these are all important to what you should be asking. Now, of course, you wait. You know. so, okay. I mean, these, these are important issues, but the fact is, it's a big commercial property without you know, the tax home as you have those categories. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate that you're thinking about cumulative impacts. That's, that's what I'm hearing is if you do one thing and then another thing and another thing, what's the sum total of that? And how do we how do we think about that and its compatibility? So I guess with that in mind, I have two questions. I'll put you on the spot again, Mike, if I can. Um, one, I believe there is a provision for when uses are mixed on a single parcel. I just flipped through my staff report and couldn't quite find it. But could you refresh our memory on how that is regard how it's regarded by the current zoning when you put different mixes of things on a parcel? Okay, so that is um, in and it's talked about up front. Let me specifically find it. Um, so on page four the staff report yeah. um, letter D at the top so the way these are combined uh, both 
approved residential units, which are three units, and the proposed non-residential square footage of 5280 um, are less than the individual density limits that are, uh, for the combined density. So there's a provision in 3002.D3 um, where you basically talk about how you would factor these. So usually what you would do is because it's one unit per two acres, you would simply they've got three units, that's six acres. Okay. So, so then you now have 3.1 acres left, which you could then calculate the floor area ratio, which comes out to 13,500. So they could have 13,500 square feet non-residential floor area. Okay, and they're proposing 5,000. Okay. So from just, it's a very kind of an objective standard and they meet the objective standard. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm seeing about that is that it, tries to govern that part of our new bylaw is trying to govern the the coverage and the amount of building on a site what it does not necessarily factor in is the intensity of use because for example for example if you had 5,000 square feet of remote storage warehouse that was never accessed that would have one intensity if you had a party barn that would have a different intensity right Yes, okay. and I think that's where the so those are two the conditional use uh, considerations come into play. Is that uh, if if this were going to be allowed simply based on that provision, we wouldn't bother having a hearing. We would just approve it. Okay. Um, the point is that the intensity of that use does make a difference, which is why we have a conditional use hearing to review whether light manufacturing. Um, is it compatible yeah. the district, so. in light manufacturing may be compatible and manufacturing would not be compatible right. there's a different definition and different expectation of the impact okay. so that was right. one question well and, that, and I, I know at least as far as that for the rural district uh, light manufacturing is conditional use manufacturing or heavy manufacturing is just not allowed it's not allowed at all yeah, correct. so to draw that line um, okay so um, the other here thing I hear you talking about Tom is um, river corridors, river meander, the space rivers need to be healthy and um, avoiding putting human hazards in the space of, of a river's natural movement over time. And we're thinking in hundreds of years here, even if something bad just happened this winter. So I'm looking at um, not our city natural resources map, but the map provided by the applicant. And I see that um, the, I'm not gonna talk about the houses cause we can't, we're not looking at that right now, but the building being proposed appears to be outside of the um, the floodway, the 50 foot river setback, and the, it looks like the river corridor is on here too, and it is outside of that. So um, I kind of wondered about that too when, when the project is being proposed because that is such a lovely floodplain up here. Like I'm riding my bike along a very flat part of Elm Street. Um, but it is out of the river corridor, the new part of the development. So I guess I just, I note that as a factor in in how it's being well, certainly is encroaching. Uh, uh, it's, a lot closer it, than what it is now. It's, it's closer than what's there now. It's but as far as the river corridor itself, which is that's the meanderville, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's closer than what wasn't there before. I, I hear you there, but um, it improves my ease, my uh, my degree of comfort with the building to know that it's outside the map of the river corridor. Just a perspective. As someone who thinks about this a lot too. Yeah. Well, and certainly there's one consideration I think you brought up about the conservation easement and the subdivision. And that's something I, I somewhat glibly uh, discussed earlier, which is as this is currently proposed, it's one lot. It's one big lot. And certainly if down the road the owner of this lot wanted to subdivide, and create these different different lots. You'd be faced with the questions that you're you're posing right now. You know, one one thing about this project that is just a feature of it is that it keeps this large 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 lot intact. Um, it doesn't seek to break it apart and make a series of small lots out of it. Um, and and in some ways, the uses that are being do raise questions as to how it will be broken up in the future. Um, 
say that it couldn't, but it would certainly address the issues that you're talking about. Um, because what they're citing is a lot of development fairly close and interrelated to each other. Um, and then, you know, just looking at the, at the site plan, a lot of the river corridor area is being preserved and undisturbed. And so the question would then become if they sought to break it up, exactly what you're raising, which is you know, how do we see the future of this lot um, beyond just simply the uses that they're proposing to put in. You know, really what we've looked at is what's in front for Elm Street, the most usable section of, of this lot. Um, but I just, I would note that there's a lot of the questions you raise are valid questions, but they would be raised if it was ever an attempt to In addition to case putting up the big and, and whether this is uh, some sort of keeper for the Well, it certainly doesn't seem right that somebody could hold on to technically three lots that they're saying that they have. Right. And, and, and be holding that <laughs> as they're applying for a report, which technically would fall into the subdivision. If, if you fell into the uh, conservation subdivision principles, then you wouldn't even be allowed sure. to. But I mean, it. subdivision's a different beast sure. altogether. You just have to, and this is this is part of um, where I'm going with that. Is that when you're talking subdivision, absolutely, you're you're talking a completely different piece because you're talking about creating independent lots to stand separate. And so, by creating four uses, you know, three houses in this in this business, are they getting around the, the conservation easement? Is this some sort of loophole? Possibly, but I'll tell you what I've I've been on the zoning board for ten years, these guys have been on longer, um, they can tell you that I've, I've never seen the uh, development quite this way, which with these multiple uses, um, it's not the norm. And so is this, you know, the question is, beyond this particular lot, is this a big loophole that people would use? You know, I don't think so. And so then the question becomes, well, for this specific use, is there something is there something in this newly proposed use that's somehow pushing it over the top um, or raising that issue beyond, you know, knowing that down the line, the future owners say, I don't want to own all this. I don't want houses. I want a business. Or I want houses, not a business. If they come back and have them divide this up, I think those questions that you're raising are valid questions that would, that well, would be part of be more, too, because you actually, like you said, you have this driver that it now becomes a common entrance. So Packing part of the development of this new right. thing onto the driveway of the other one. I mean, let's face it, you devalue now the houses that are there because who wants to be driving into the business to get to the house? So you know, but that, that's become, you know, that's that know. fine line that we have in zoning, which is part of it is that we want to regulate and we want to make sure that the uses conform with the, with the general pattern. But at the same time, we want to have flexibility. And, you know, the old legal saw is, you know, zoning is a derogation of, of private property rights. So, you know, we, we do want to regulate, but we also want to have owners have that flexibility. So if they want to do something that conventionally we would think uh, that devalues it, we would want a business next to uh, a home. We don't know. But if there's a market for it and somebody's willing to put their money behind it, it's their property to do it on. I think what, what our concerns are, and we've raised a lot of them, you know, are looking at the, the larger overall picture that are guided by the zoning bylaws. So, for example, things like light, light manufacturing versus manufacturing. This was an actual manufacturing, like a heavier manufacturing, and these are defined in the zoning bylaws. It would be a different, different topic, but the fact is that light manufacturing is the Planning Commission has outlined as, as promulgated as rules is allowable in this area. Even notwithstanding all the language in the beginning where it talks about keeping open and conservation land and keeping this area um, dedicated to forestry which and, and farming and open land, which generally does you know, dominate this area. But at the same time, the, the bylaws allow for this kind of uh, development. As a DRP, we're charged with enforcing the violence.
two things to do. They can't do the accounts. But I think these are all valid concerns. Is there anything else that you need? Um, well, I guess that you know, pretty much covers it. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have no? Um, no. Well, I just came because I. I well, you wouldn't mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> And just state your name so that the record reflects sure. that. I'm Jesse Fletcher. Um, I live at 2320 Street in the Midwest. So, yes. um, I came because I wanted to see what was going on with the, what the plans are going to be, what the building looks like, um, what potential sound impacts or visual um, resources uh, around. Um, overall, I think the plans are really good. Um, I, I do hear some of the concerns. Open land is important. It's uh, in living there um, on on that slope on the other side. I mean, it is amazing the wildlife that's there. There's just everything. It's very protected that hill, but just the animals feel very safe there. And they all come down through that area and uh, drink from the from the river. There. Sound was a concern that I had, you know. Uh, sound tends to travel up, like we do hear the road uh, from there quite well. So I had these visions of, you know, uh, sawmills and stuff, it's like freaking me out a little bit. So I wanted to, you know, hear how that would be mitigated. Um, it sounds like, you know, that's that's all within reason and, and it didn't uh, pose any, any major impacts. So. Any other questions from the board? So, where I was starting to go, and I apologize, I didn't mean to cut anyone off for public comment. But uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Do we want to take this under advisement? Do we want to uh, take a public vote on this now? Uh, you know, given the amount of material, I think it could have to be a written decision. Um, but I'll entertain a motion. Well, let's just talk for a second before a motion. Sure. Uh, I mean, there, there, there could be good reasons to take under advisement being with the ordinance being uh, as yes. new as it is. Right. And for us to be the most thoughtful that we could possibly be. But I'm open to going either direction, depending on what the other members feel. Yeah. If we went into session on this could we deliver a decision tonight at, could could we do that tonight yeah, I mean, I, I would, we would we would take a vote and then I mean a normal practice and I think this is what Kevin's getting at which I think makes sense which is thus far we've been really thoughtful about I've only been on signing on one which is much simpler than this in some respects uh, in the parking lot um, but Given the newness of these bylaws, it seems to make sense to draft a written decision with findings. You know, for for example, one of the things when we're talking about the officers, um, we're not the, the consensus was generally away from making it a condition, but certainly having findings that would support the business and accessory use and defining and making clear you know, that that is. So I mean, that would tend to be to think about this as a, as a written decision. Certainly some of the comments that we want to be, um, I think, thoughtful about. I mean, at one point, especially if given the proximity to a river corridor, I think we want to be very specific about any type of erosion control concerns um, and how we articulate that. Um, and so simply having some generic reference may not satisfy. I mean, I'm not saying that we are or not. It's just those things strike me directly towards a written decision as opposed to a verbal or oral delivery. Chair, I'll be happy to make a motion to close the, close the part of the hearing for evidence. 
talking to Tom Brady. Yeah. Motion by Jack. Second. Second by Kevin. Any further deliberation? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All right, we are going to move into uh, deliberative session. So thank you all for coming. The evidence is closed. Appreciate everyone's participation and thoughtful. Three minute break. Yep, we'll take a three minute break. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.